Oh, there we go. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you guys for having me. My name is Danielle. Uh, last message, I was like, you know, I got some pre-game nerves, right? I played soccer at NDSU, and I'm like, I'm excited, but I'm a little nervous. But now that, you know, I did one half, halftime, here we go, second half, I'm excited. So who's excited to be at church today? Are you guys excited? <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited. So, like I said, my name's Danielle. I played soccer at NDSU. Are there any NDSU alumni in the house tonight? Today. Today. Oh, louder? Are you in the house? I can't hear you. I know all the college students are at the SALT conference, so I need the alumni to raise it up. But I also, though, I am very loyal to UND as well, the University of North Dakota. I served there with my husband for eight years through Chi Alpha, so I love um, the Fighting Hawks. Fighting Sue, whatever your loyalties are. I'm sure there's alumni in this room as well. Um, but along with that, I've been married to my husband for 10 years. Love it. Love him. You're amazing. Marriage is really fun. We have a lot of fun. But then my favorite role that I have in life, well, okay, I have a lot of favorite roles. One being the daughter of God. But I am also a stay-at-home mom to my two-year-old son, Ravi. I don't have a picture of him because if I did, he's way too cute and you would not focus on me at all. You would just be like, wow, that kid is adorable. Uh, but you can always see him. Usually between services, we hang out and have toast at the coffee shop. If you've never had toast at the coffee shop, you guys, you need to try it. It's homemade. Paisley, my girl, who's the manager of the coffee of North Brew, makes it amazing. So that's a little bit about me. But before I get into my message, I do want to give honor where honor is due. Um, I would not be standing up here before you today if it wasn't for Pastor Dave and Pastor Alyssa. Uh, not just because they gave me the opportunity to speak here. I'm very grateful for that, uh, that they would trust me with that. I'm so thankful. But because when uh, I was in college at NDSU, when my husband and I were, Pastor Dave and Alyssa made the decision that they we're going to be intentional with their lives and live for Jesus and disciple people. And so Pastor Dave uh, was very intentionally discipling my husband. Very glad he did because if I would have met my husband when he was a freshman during this time, there would have been a ton of red flags. And I, I would not, I would have been like that guy. Mm -mm, no. So I'm very thankful that Pastor Dave discipled you and helped shape you to the man you are today and how the Lord did that. I love you, babe. But not only Pastor Dave, but Pastor Alyssa as well. So Pastor Alyssa actually led a small group in my dorm room in North Weibel, and she was so consistent at knocking on my door every week and inviting me to come, and I was very consistent at turning her down because I didn't want anything to do with that. Like, I wanted Jesus, and I was going to Chi Alpha, but I also wanted to live my life the way that I wanted to, and I did end up going to one of her small groups, and you know, I, I roll in, I have a negative mindset, I'm like, these girls, they're gonna be too perfect, you know, they got their lives together. Me, I got all my shame and junk, and they're gonna be, they're being vulnerable, I don't like, oh, no, 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 not for me. And so I went one time, and never came back, which I'm sure, you know, was discouraging for Alyssa being a leader. Being a leader is challenging at times, right? But I encourage you guys, persevere through it. And so it wasn't until two years later that I fully surrendered my life to the Lord. Alyssa had gone and graduated. And I ended up reaching out to her and apologizing for, uh, you know, ghosting her and not being the best friend that there could be. And so I'm living proof today that, you, you know, maybe some of you in this room, this is a word for you. Maybe you have a friend or a family member who, you know, you think it's impossible, right? Because Alyssa probably looked at me and thought, okay, this girl, there's no hope for her. Like, she seems like an impossible situation. Uh, but her prayers were powerful, and I know she prayed for me. And so for you, if you have someone in your life who's been to church, thinks it's lame, whatever, man, keep praying for them, keep loving them, because I promise you, it is not impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. So good. So with that, um, we're going to get into my sermon tonight. And so have you guys been enjoying the Bible sermon series that we kicked off in 2023? Raise your hand, yeah. Pastor Stephen, the first week, preached about how the Bible is good for you. Very convicting. Very, I love that message. I took a ton of notes, too many notes. And then last week, my husband preached on how the Bible is our daily bread, the importance of getting into Scripture every day. And that convicted me, too. I really enjoyed that one. And if you missed those, you can check them out online um, and watch them. I highly recommend it. They are so good. But so I am going to be sharing with you guys a sermon titled, The Bible is Alive. The Bible is alive. And like, what does that even mean? So when I was thinking about this, you know, I'm like, oh, like some people might think of, you know, some books and fantasy series where they're like alive and trying to eat you or like you're trying to control. Like, I can't, like, they're alive. I'm not talking about that. Or my mind went this way. So how many of you guys have an Alexa in your home? Raise your hand, yeah. 
And Alexa, okay, they kind of freak me out. We have not one, not two, but three Alexas in our house because my husband likes having them. And sometimes I get jealous. I'm like, why are you asking her what the time is? I have my phone. I can answer it. I can tell you, like, don't talk to her, talk to me. Um, And it also freaks me out because I'm like, she's kind of alive, right? Like she's listening to every conversation I don't know how I feel about that. I don't like that. So she's kind of alive. And so as I was thinking about this, I'm like, wow, you know, technology has grown a lot in the years. And I would not be surprised in the future if they made smart Bibles or, you know, like AI Bibles. Where And so I, I pictured myself having coffee with a friend, got my smart Bible in my backpack. And, you know, as I'm talking to my friend, we start to talk about another friend. And we're like, oh, yeah, that person. I can't believe she did this. She's so annoying. And then all of a sudden my phone, you know, my Bible vibrates and it goes, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it sounded like you were about to start gossiping. Here are some scriptures for you that I think would help you in this situation. Out loud in public for everyone to hear. That would be convicting. I'd be like, yes, you're right, Bible. I will take the, the... the Holy Spirit and his convictions, you know, telling me that, but it's kind of easy, sometimes it's easier to ignore him, right? Like, okay, God, I know, uh, but I'm just gonna keep saying it. But no, if you got this smart Bible talking and the whole coffee shop can hear you, oh no. So who knows, friends? You heard it here first, maybe I should patent that idea. I don't know, maybe they're already working on it. But, (laughs) so that's not what I'm talking about when I say the Bible is alive. The Bible is not an AI Bible, it's not listening to you. The Holy Spirit is. But so where I get that from is in Hebrews 4.12, It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. Some translations say it is living and active. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So it is alive and powerful, active in my life. But how does that, how is it alive? That's what we're going to get into today. I'm going to pray before I get into my three points for you guys. So Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this beautiful Sunday. I pray, Lord, that your word would convict us, that you would speak through me, and that we would leave challenged and ready and excited to read your word and to live out that the Bible is alive. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, amen. All right, so the first point I have for you guys today is that the Bible is alive because Jesus is alive. The Bible is alive because Jesus is alive. It's living and active because Jesus is living and active. We do not serve a dead God, my friends. Our God is alive. Um, And Jesus said in his great commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Um, It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is with us. That is a promise from Jesus. He is here today. He even said to for the um, disciples to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is living and active in our lives today. You can read that in the book of Acts. But the Holy Spirit is called a counselor and a helper, and he has been a counselor and a helper and a friend in my life, living and active right here, right today. And I think it's cool because, you know, there's a lot of people who have died in our world, a lot of important people, um, religious, you know, figures, all of that, and the thing with these people is that when they died, they stayed dead. These people stayed dead. But our person, our Jesus, the most important person, died for us, one of the only people in all religions to do that. He didn't stay dead. He rose again, and he is now alive. And I think that is so awesome. And the Apostle Paul was so confident that we serve a God that's not dead that he even wrote this. In 1 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19, he said, And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, and you are guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, We are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. The Apostle Paul said that. Like, why would you expose us like that? Right? Like, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. If this isn't true, if Jesus didn't rise again and he wasn't alive, 
He exposed us, but he wouldn't have said that if he wasn't confident that Jesus was alive. You know, and he had an encounter with the Lord in the book of Acts where he met him face to face, blinded, all these incredible things. I encourage you, read the book of Acts. But he is alive. And so that sets the groundwork for this message. You know, the Bible is live, friends, because Jesus is alive. Moving on to my second point is the Bible is alive because it has the power to counsel, convict, and change us. It has the power to counsel, convict, and change us. Now, I am living proof of that. Around 13 years ago when I was in college, um, I was not the same person that I am today. I was a completely different person. And I had gone, you know, to Chi Alpha my freshman year, and I was excited. I'm like, okay, like, these people have something that I don't have. Like, they're raising their hands during worship. I'm not used to that. Um, I felt something different. Like, it was, like, definitely the presence of God. I didn't have words for it at the time. Um, but I was still afraid, you know. I still had my stuff, and I didn't fully want to surrender. And, you know, and I avoided Pastor Alyssa at the time, and so I was living for myself, and I was wrestling with God with a lot of things. I'm going to name a few of those things. Um, I had a lot of anger issues. I grew up in a home, like, my parents were incredible, but we also just had bad, <laughs> manage, like, we didn't manage our emotions very well. We were very angry, and I took that anger out, too, in soccer, where I would play from anger instead of from a place of peace. Um, so I was angry. I was not that confident. I acted like I was. You know, I put a face on. You know, I'm cool. I'm good. No, deep down I knew I had all these insecurities. Um, I also, let me think. Oh, I also was very fluent in gossip. And I loved to complain. And that was really like the foundation of a lot of my friendships was just gossip. Like, oh, let's talk about that person. Oh, yeah, we have a mutual hatred for someone. Yay. You know, just hor like at the time, you know, yeah, this is good. It's normal. No. Um, I also would give in to peer pressure. I got drunk. I was mean to people. I wouldn't say I was like a bully, but I was definitely mean to those I wanted to be mean to. Or if someone hurt my friend, I was like, no, I'm going to hurt you back. Uh -uh. So I took, put judgment in my own hands. Not the thing to do. I was also in a sexual relationship with someone. And within the sexual relationship, my greatest like, sin, not just the sexual part, was my idolatry of this person. I'm like, this person was my life. I didn't think I could do life without them. And I loved them before I loved God. So they were sitting on the throne of my life instead of where God was supposed to be. And also with that, too, I was also wrestling with my sexual identity. So I had a lot of things that I was wrestling with. And before I go on, I do want to say if any of those things resonated with you at all, man, I, if you're a woman, I would love to meet up with you and, you know, have coffee. I believe in the power of being intentional and wrestling through things together and the power of stories. And so if you ever wanted to meet up, I'm here for you. Also, we have a powerful ministry team at the end. If you need prayer for anything, you want to talk to them, you can come up. That will be at the end of the message. But so I was wrestling with all these things, and I didn't have people to counsel me, right? I avoided Alyssa when she was inviting me. And when I went, so this is my sophomore year now in college, I went to Kyle twice that year because I was in, like, the, the depths of my sin at that point. Like, I was in the pit, stuck in it. Um, and I went to Chi Alpha, and many of you guys know Pastor Brad. He was the Chi Alpha pastor. Love him. He's a teddy bear, like, the sweetest guy. However, if you know him, he has a resting angry face, Anyone know? Does anyone know what I'm saying? And, and he's a teddy bear, right? Like, and he knows. I've talked to him about this. We laugh about it. So I'm not throwing him under the bus. But he looked at me once in Chi Alpha. He didn't even know me. I didn't know him. And I, he looked at me, and I'm like, he knows. I can't be here. He knows all my junk. No. And so I embraced condemnation instead of conviction. And those are two very different things, right? Conviction is a gift from God to be embraced. I welcome conviction now in my life. Oh, I love conviction. But I embrace condemnation, which is a lie from the enemy, and it causes shame. And so I embraced that, and I stopped going to Chi Alpha. I wasn't talking to people about stuff. So I, I didn't have counsel, didn't have conviction, because I was living in condemnation, and I really didn't think that I could be changed. I thought I was going to be stuck in what I was doing, and I just I didn't, I didn't feel like there was any hope for me. And so it got to this point where, you know, I'm like, okay, I need something, and I have a Bible. I'm going to read it. I'm going to do something with this. And so I, I didn't really know where to start. And so I would Google, like, things. And be like, okay, 
what does the Bible say about this? Or what does the Bible say about that? And so I used that as a starting point to get into it. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to read Romans. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians. Whoa, this is crazy. And going back to Hebrews 4.12 again, where it said that the word of God is living and active or alive and powerful. But it's like a double-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, exposing our innermost thoughts and desires. Yeah, as I started to read it, I felt it. I was like, oh, yeah, well, that's calling me out. I am definitely doing that. It says that? What? Stab, stab, stab. And I know that sounds violent, right? Like, okay, the Bible's going to, it's a sword. It's going to stab you. Like, is it going to murder you? No. It's going to murder your old self, actually. But, <laughs> but so as, uh, as I was reading it, I'm like, okay, this is stabbing me in the heart. And I love this example. So who's the medical professional in here? We have some incredible people, yes, people who can, you know, draw blood and cut people up for good. Yeah, props to you. You guys are my heroes because I can't do that. I have passed out three times. My husband can testify just by someone telling me a story about an accident or blood. I've literally, I'm like, I'm going to pass out. I'm going to sit down. Body just needed a system restart to get back up. Yeah, so I don't even know why I'm sharing this because I might pass out, but I won't. So anyway, this summer I had a mole that was pretty questionable on my arm. And I was delaying going in, and because I'm like, I don't, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to know. Yeah, it looks a little weird. Uh, so I go in, and they're like, oh, yeah, let's, let's shave that off and test it. Test it. They're like, yeah, it could be a little precancer. We don't know, cancerous. Let's, we're just going to cut it out. We're cut out like a five-millimeter radius all around. Sweet, good, please do that. And I'm like, are you going to put me out for that? Because that, that sounds intense, right? I'm going to need stitches. They're like, oh, no, it's, it's minor. You'll need stitches, but you're going to be awake. And I'm like... <laughs> No, I don't want to be awake for this, okay? Uh, and so when I went in and they did it, I told them, like, it's not an if, it's a I will pass out. Right, it's not a when, it's a, I'm going to, yeah. So I did pass out. I told them. I'm laying there. I'm like, it's happening. Okay, came to. And they're like, oh, you weren't kidding. No, I'm not kidding. I know myself. Ah. But anyway, I'm so grateful. So they did. They cut in with sharp knives, right, or scalpels, whatever you want to call it. I didn't go to med school. Or nursing school, <laughs> but they used a sharp object, right? And technically that's violent to cut into someone, but they did it with the intention to take out the bad and to stitch me up and bring healing, right? And so the word of God, the whole purpose of the double-edged sword, why it's described as that, is because it's always meant to cleanse and to heal, right? It's always meant to cut in and get the bad out. And that was what was happening with my life. I was like, yeah, I'm getting cut, get all this cancer stuff out. Um, and now that I've had that experience when I first read the Bible, now when I read the word, and this is why I loved Pastor Mark's message on how the Bible is our daily bread, getting into it daily, because now I see it like, like radiation therapy to my sin. Because, you know, there's always things that can come up. Like, man, I'm feeling a little prideful. You're right, God. After I read your word, like, thank you. Like, oh, man, I was really angry and frustrated at my husband or my son hit me five times, did not listen, doesn't understand yet. Teach, you got any wisdom, please let me know. I'm learning, he's two, he's two. And like Mark said, terrific twos, I love it. I'm so optimistic, I actually love all of it. Um, but anyway, so it's like radiation therapy to my sin every day when I read the word, and that's why I do it. It's so important, I wanna be more like Jesus. I don't want to go back to the way I was. I wanna be reminded, and it's such a big book. Man, I can't memorize it all. I'm not that good at memorization. Some of you can relate in here, right? When people are so good at rattling off scripture, I'm like, I wish I was that good, and I'm a pastor, I should be better. Mark is really good at that. Um, so that's why I read it every day, I need it. So anyway, the, I do wanna give you an example of one of the scriptures that stabbed me in the heart. Maybe it'll stab you in the heart, that's okay. Be convicted, grab onto it, don't feel condemned, because this totally con or convicted me. And it's in Romans 1, uh, chapter, or verses 28 through 32. And it says, Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. Check, 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 check. Stab, 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 stab. Ugh, all these things, even murder, right? I would hate people to the point, not that I wanted them to die, but hating your brother is the same as murder, right? So all of these things, I'm like, yeah. And then verse 31, they refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. 
They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too, which was me, all of this. So when I was reading Romans, I'm like, huh, yeah, that's convicting. And so, hey, maybe that's convicting to you. Read it. But I do want to share an encouraging verse, too, that is also alive and active in my life. The Bible is also very encouraging. Um, I think Pastor Stephen shared that on during his message, but in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this is one of my life verses. It says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, the new life has come. Another translation says, everything is fresh and new. And I began to feel that as I let the Bible come alive in my life. And so the Bible was counseling me, it was convicting me, and it was changing me. But one of the main ways it changed me, which is my next point, is that the Bible is alive when we obey. So I had to start obeying and listening to what I was reading in order for it to become alive in me. And so yes, the Bible is alive independently from us, right? But if you feel like, maybe you're in here today and you're like, Throughout this sermon series on the Bible, you're like, man, the Bible, though, is kind of boring or it kind of feels dead to me. I don't know. I really don't get what people say. Then I would ask, are you obeying it when you're reading? Like, are you letting the wisdom, the counsel of God change you by obeying by obeying it. And it really wasn't until I started to do that to make those changes that I started to come more alive in Christ and see the Bible working in me. And doing, like, doing that looked like, man, the Bible tells me to pray. I should start praying. Man, the Bi- like, man, I should make disciples. Let me tell you, friends, when I started to make disciples and I started to care about that, I'm like, man, people need to know. My life was changed. I want to tell people. I got so excited, and the Bible and living a Christian life was no longer boring to me because I got to have a front row seat to my friends' lives being changed by God when I was able to encourage and disciple them. And that's why I'm still doing it today, and I won't stop. I'm going to die doing this because it is so fun. And I am not a boring person. I hate being boring. I'm an Enneagram 7, right? Life needs to be fun. Being a follower of Jesus is super, super fun. Um, and And Jesus said this. These are Jesus' words. In John 14, 15, it says, If you love me, obey my commandments. If you love me, obey my commandments. <sighs> and then in 1 John 2, 3 through 6, it says, And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Convicting all of it. And so challenging. And it's, I mean, I want to live my life as Jesus did. The only way I can do that is if I obey what he says in his word. And so, man, the whole book of 1 John 2, if you're looking for other places to start in the Bible, read the book 1 John. It's shorter, powerful, cut you to the heart. But so I propose that, yeah, the Bible is not boring. Being a Christian is not boring. And if it feels that way, then I would say, man, maybe the reason why is because it's actually us that make the Bible boring. Or we're the ones that are making church boring. Because it's not boring when we start doing it. It's so fun. And so with this, uh, the Bible is alive when we obey. What does obedience look like? So maybe some of you in this room, maybe your step of obedience is just to start reading the Bible. Just to take it out, start doing it. Man, This I love that we did this in the beginning of the year and the whole New Year's resolution thing. Man, make a new one right now. Start reading your Bible. Or maybe it's reaching out to the person that you hurt in the past. Because, man, I had a list. And I even asked the Holy Spirit, bring to mind people that I have hurt in my past so that I can apologize to them. Some of them I would call and apologize, in person apologize. Or if I didn't see them, I would just, like, Facebook message them. But I knew, I was like, man, I did hurt people. And I knew me being obedient was, hey, I'm going to reach out to them and apologize and tell them, man, Jesus changed my life. I now know that I was horrible. (laughs) I am not who I used to be, and I'm sorry. And that was really freeing too for me and for them. Forgiveness is beautiful. 
Um, or maybe it's just simply surrendering your life to Jesus. Some of you in this room might be on the edge of that. Maybe you've been to church or you've called yourself a Christian, you kind of, you know, fallen away, start doing your own thing again. But man, maybe your, your step of obedience is like, hey, I want to recommit my life. I want to surrender my life to Jesus tonight. And so if I could have everyone stand up in here, I'm going to give you an opportunity for that. And then I'll pray over you guys as we conclude our message. But if that's you in here, could I, everyone have their eyes closed. Could you raise your hand if you're like, I want to commit my life to Jesus. I want to re-surrender my life to Jesus. Just so I know who I'm praying for. That's awesome. And if that's you, you can pray this in your heart. You can say, Jesus, I know I got stuff. I know I got junk and shame and sin. I know I am not perfect and I need you. Jesus, I pray that you would come into my life right now and that you would make me new. I wanna surrender my life to you, Jesus. I ask that you would give me the wisdom to do that. You would give me, you would empower me to live a life of obedience from now until forever and that you would just continue to purify me, do radiation therapy on my sin, Lord. I need you and I thank you, Jesus. And I'm gonna pray over all of us. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have allowed us to have just access to it, that we can read it and learn from it and delight in it. And it says like, you know, your name is like honey on our lips. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. We are so grateful for that, Father. I pray that you would give everyone in this room um, just a fresh revelation of what it means to follow you, a fresh revelation of the Bible of your word and what it means, how it's alive because you are alive. I pray, Lord, that you would empower us, that you would convict us, you would counsel us, and you would change us when we read your word. And God, I pray that you give us the ability and like just the excitement to obey it. We love you, Jesus. We are so excited to serve you. Father, I pray protection over everyone in this room, and I pray that you would bless their lives and that you would help us rise up to be the church to our friends and family that are all over the place that may not know you, that we would be obedient in that as well. And that we'd be excited. It would be a joy and a delight to do that. Thank you, Jesus. We love you so much. In your name.